Hello, everybody. Jesse Schreck here with Missions Incorporated, the podcast of Practical Missions Cohort, a mission focused exclusively in the country of Italy. And today we are episode number 312. Uh, we're going to be giving some updates, some announcements, things like this related to the ministry for our ministry partners so they can stay engaged and be praying for us and all of this. And then we're going to dive into a lesson uh, related to the topic of missions, but specifically the topic of preaching. So we're going to look at overlooked essentials of preaching well done. I'll go ahead and run the, the intro, and then we'll go ahead and get into those announcements and dive into our lesson for today. Again, welcome. Uh, my name is Jesse Schreck, and I'm a missionary with the Practical Missions Cohort in the country of Italy. been serving here in the country of Italy since 2007, uh, carrying on the work, passing it on to others, seeking by God's grace to get others incorporated into the work as well. And uh, here we are uh, currently, uh, it's Black Friday, so Thanksgiving was yesterday. Hope you had a nice Thanksgiving. We did as well as a family. Our, our son was sick. We weren't able to have anybody over. We weren't able to go out and do anything, um, but we did uh, grab a couple turkey legs uh, at a store. It's not easy to find a turkey here in Italy, uh, but we got some turkey legs, a little bit of turkey meat and we made mashed potatoes, corn, all that kind of stuff. We had a good time together as a family, something simple, but it was nice. It was relaxing. Today's, uh, it's not a holiday uh, in Italy, uh, but we we took half a day for ourselves just to do that and to pass on to our kids that good tradition. My wife's not even American, so for her it's all different, but she's done a real good job at uh, taking on the, the Thanksgiving holiday, and she's actually become quite a good cook when it comes to Thanksgiving, uh, the meal, even made a wonderful, delicious apple pie, which we're going to have again tonight after dinner. And uh, so all that was super great. We're very thankful, and it's a good time of the year to be thankful. And uh, as we do this podcast episode now today, uh, uh, reminds me as well, I'm thankful for all of you guys, the, the ministry partners, supporters that keep us full time at the Lord's service in the country of Italy, where it's just so barren today. So few believers here, uh, less than 1% of the population is evangelical. The churches, typically speaking, are very few and very scattered. Uh, bodies of believers between 10 and 30 people, typically uh, renting out storefronts, gathering together, looking like a cult. Uh, that's the reality for most of us here in the country of Italy. Uh, the need is great. 90% of the missionaries coming to Italy end up leaving within just four years, right? Uh, I mean, the statistics and the realities here are staggering. really still blows my mind after all this time. Uh, but thanks to, to you guys who keep us uh, at the Lord's service, preaching the gospel, evangelizing the lost, making disciples of Jesus Christ, and doing the work of church planning in all of its aspects. So uh, we're really thankful to God for, for you and for that uh, and to be at his service. Now, what we're going to do is uh, I have a few announcements, so I'll, I'll run through the list of things that we're going to look at today. <laughs> As we, as we dive into that, I have a couple updates and announcements. We're going to look at the, the Vitter family, talk briefly about them. I have a photo or something to, yeah, photo to share, a couple prayer requests as well. Uh, we're going to look at uh, two new blog posts. Just wanted to share that with our supporters and ministry partners. Let them see the two new blog posts that are available at practicalmissions.org. Monthly support, talk briefly. We want to uh, about that and how you can support and partner. Uh, search for uh, Rustico, uh, Rustico, as they call it here in Italian. Uh, we'll explain what that means and what that's about. And uh, lastly, also summer uh, 2024, opportunities for getting involved and serving uh, here in the country of Italy. Uh, so we're going to talk briefly about that as well. All right. First thing we want to look at, the, the Vitter family. They have arrived. In our previous uh, uh, podcast episode, we had mentioned uh, the Vitter family is on their way. Uh, in our previous, uh, our last two emails, we spoke briefly about the, the Vitter family. And we also told the story as to how we got connected with them, how they got connected with us. And, and all of that, we asked you to pray for them and so on. Long story short, uh, they saw the provoked uh, podcast interview that we were on. And, uh, you know, a year and a half or so ago and heard about us and heard about the ministry, got in touch with us and we, a friendship formed and, uh, and also they, they understood the kind of ministry we do and they align well with that. And, uh, now they're, they raised support, did all the work and they are here now. They arrived, uh, just like eight, 10 days ago, something like this a week ago, basically. And, uh, and here we are, we got together and uh, now we're helping them, praying with them. They're doing documentation and all that kind of stuff, uh, getting their documents in order and, uh, looking for a place, uh, to live out of here in the, in the area. So a couple of prayer requests here that we sent out in our email. If you're not on our email list, by the way, go ahead and be sure to sign up at practicalmissions.org. A little box pops up when you go to the website and you can uh, stay tuned. It's the easiest way to stay in touch with us. Simply leave an email address and your name. And uh, when we send out updates uh, to ministry partners, 
uh, you'll get our email and you'll see the latest and see some of the inside access. Easiest way to stay involved in the ministry here in Italy. Um, but here are some ways you can pray for the vitters. Documentation. Okay, Robert has a new visa, but now needs to get the whole family connected to his papers. It's not so simple in Italy. Uh, Lara, his wife, is working on getting Italian citizenship. And uh, we just got the message from them yesterday that... Uh, they, they found success. They were given the okay. They don't have to leave Italy. They don't have to go back to America to work out the rest of the documentation. They can do everything they need to hear from Italy with the, the visa that he has. Everybody else can be brought in, and it's a good thing she's going to be getting citizenship as well just to have all their bases covered. So praise God for that. But now there's still all the uh, the filling out of papers, which is complex in Italy. It's uh, it's a famous thing, the bureaucracy, everything in Italy. Uh, so pray for them for God's grace to get it all done and get it done successfully in the right way the first time. And uh, that would be great. We invite you to do that, to pray. Uh, home search. Okay, this is point number two here on this list, uh, ways you can pray for this new family that's joining in with us. Uh, pray that the Lord would lead them to the right home for them to live out of. Okay. Husband, wife, plus six children. Uh, uh, so it's uh, going to be a good size house. And we want them to have a house that can, they can also host people at as well, comfortably. It's important to have people into your house on a consistent basis. But the housing in Italy typically is significantly smaller than the housing we're used to in the States. And to have an open space and an ability to host other people is hard to find. And unfortunately, prices for rent are through the roof right now. And so all these things together makes it a little bit complicated. We invite you, please pray for them to find a good place at a good deal that is suitable uh, for the family. And then just a brief update here from our email update. I'll, I'll share this with folks who don't get our email yet, but do uh, tune into the podcast, either watching or listening. Uh, the church plant cohort from Estre is now taking form. So the team working together to see this church realized. Uh, praise be to God. We have another family potentially joining up with us in the fall of 2024. So the Vitters have arrived, and it looks like we have another family now in the pipe. They just filled out an application. They're going to be coming, Lord willing, next fall to serve for uh, anywhere from one to three months, and then their prayer is to see that turned into full-time, long-term. Uh, so that's that's also a great answer to prayer. Uh, we're also in the process of getting a short-term cohort, a musical ministry team, and potentially a vision trip organized for the summer of 2024. Uh, if you're interested in playing a role next summer, don't hesitate to reach out. Lastly, pray for us as we enter the Christmas season. So here's a little prayer request, part of our updates and our announcements. Uh, the Christmas season here in Italy is a thing. Everybody is celebrating. Everybody is doing normal Christmas stuff, similar to in the States. Lights, trees, all that stuff everywhere. Uh, pray for open doors for us uh, and the gospel, and that God the Father would draw folks to himself for salvation here in this town, in this time, now. Uh, we invite you to pray with us for that. Uh, and uh, and now we're taking to the streets, uh, the piazza and the digital piazza with regular Bible exhortations at Vera Vita the, uh, to evangelize the lost. And, and so pray for us uh, for the ministry here leading up to Italy, or uh, not to Italy, to, uh, sorry, uh, fixing my socks, uh, to, uh, yeah, to, uh, leading up to Christmas. That would be wonderful. So we're going to be going out uh, starting on uh, Monday with tracks, uh, house to house to different places. And uh, and then in the piazza, together as a family, handing out tracts to people, starting up conversations, and whatever other doors God opens for us, but also pumping out regular content between now and Christmas uh, for the media ministry as well, the Vita Vita media ministry. All right? So that's what we have there for that. Now, a couple of the blog posts that I wanted to mention, uh, these updates, these are the grant, the, the grand orchestrator of our lives and ministries. This is a blog that's available, practicalmissions.org forward slash blog. You can check that out. This one in particular tells the story of how uh, I cried out to the Lord in prayer, Things were just hard in the ministry uh, and poured out my heart to God within, I said 48 hours, but I think it was even less than 24 hours. Got a special message, turned into a nice podcast interview with a, with a ministry that has a lot of uh, uh, listeners and followers. Uh, the Vitter family, through that, also heard about us and the ministry here. God worked in their hearts to, to find that and to find us and to reach out. And now a missionary family is here. So there's a lot of encouragement and exhortation there to pour out your heart to the Lord. Trust in him. He's working all things out. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't go into despair. Trust in the Lord. So check out that blog post uh, that, that could be a verification for you. I, I trust it would be. And then another blog post uh, that could be useful to you, but also maybe to somebody you know, Tips for preparing for a missionary career. So I think there's nine practical tips there for preparing for a missionary career, uh, something that's not always clearly understood for the average Christian. And uh, there are more folks, I believe, that the Lord is calling to uh, a career in missions abroad, doing different things like what we do here at Practical Missions Cohort, uh, but they just don't have an avenue or a way or an understanding even of how that would work and how that would actually become a reality for them. So that could be helpful for either you or somebody you know who has that inclination or desire to get involved in missions. So be sure to uh, check that out as well or pass it on to somebody that you know might be interested. All right. Uh, the next thing on our list is 
this here. This has to do with giving. We do need support. Uh, we need increased monthly support to carry the mission forward. So if you went to practicalmissions.org forward slash donate, you would see this page here. It tells you about uh, how you can donate uh, tax deductible donations to Practical Missions Cohort, either by sending in a check or by donating online, quick, fast, and easy. You can become a monthly partner or send in a one-time uh, donation, or you can contribute to some studio gear that we need always growing the media ministry. So uh, it's quite a big part of the ministry, actually. So there's different ways to get involved to support there. We encourage you to check that out. If you're not already supporting missionaries personally, uh, you have an opportunity here with us. We do have need. Uh, it's been a tough time the last few years, economically and all the rest. And we are in need of a boost still. A handful of people have just come on recently as monthly partners, and we thank God for that. We thank God for you. Wonderful. Uh, many people already are partners, but if you're not yet a partner and you're interested, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, talk about that. Uh, everything really does make a difference. Uh, we are entirely faith, uh, faith-based ministry. So we depend and operate entirely on the contributions of, uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ, individuals and churches, uh, to keep us moving forward, to keep the gospel going forward here in this area through this ministry. So, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact us or just go ahead and make donation. If you feel inclined, uh, we welcome support. We need it. And it's a wonderful, tangible way, the body of Christ working together. If you're not able to go, you can tangibly help us keep going to souls, one at a time, bringing the gospel forward here in this country through your contributions. So uh, we thank you for that. All right, cohort dates. Another thing I wanted to mention, summer 2024, we have a cohort set up for June 17th to June 27th, short-term evangelism team, getting together mass literature distributions, park ministry, piazza ministry, all kinds of different things there. Wonderful opportunity, about 10 days. There's a team in June, there's a team in July. Go ahead and check out the website, uh, practicalmissions.org forward slash cohort dash dates. Check that out. You can see the dates there. And then there's also info uh, to learn more about the cohorts themselves. There's a link to that short uh, term cohorts. You can go to that page as well to learn more about how does that work? What does it look like? You can listen to the podcast episode if you want as well to get more information about that. Uh, but it looks like we have one team already uh, considering uh, to come out next summer. We're working on getting one team and then we have helpers coming from... Uh, uh, yeah, to help with a, with a music ministry, to do a, a concert here. We're looking forward to that and potentially maybe a vision trip or something towards the end of August, early September, which is a combination of uh, 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 evangelism cohort and a vision trip to get an understanding of uh, the lay of the land and what is going on uh, here in the country. Last announcement before we dive into our lesson for today is this here, uh, Rustico. Uh, the ministry, we are really praying. We've been praying about this for a while and now we're praying about it even more, looking to pick up a property of some sorts. Uh, uh, this picture here, for example, is uh, something that is available at a pretty decent price and uh, something that the, the ministry can operate out of over here in Italy for the next 20 years easily uh, to see two different churches planted in two different major cities here in this area. And uh, we can operate out of this, uh, a place to gather folks together easily, a place to host uh, the short-termers that come out, even interns that come out, uh, gives us space for all of that kind of stuff, space for the media ministry that is expanding, space for uh, even the family to live off of this and operate and uh, do all kinds of events and outreach, all kinds of different possibilities. Uh, we're looking at getting a, a, what we could call a, a center or something like this. Uh, so please pray uh, for us about that. Or if you happen to be an Italian-American and you love your... your um, Paisani, if you love your, your people back home in Italy, you want to see them reach, you want to see the gospel go forward here in Italy, uh, and you have tons of extra money or something like that, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you wanted to contribute it to the ministry, talk to us, reach out to us, and uh, we can look at uh, this. But do, at very least, we, we encourage you, pray for us. We're looking at, it's, to find something like this that, that God would provide so we can operate the ministry out of uh, and have all that we need to really flourish here uh, in this time and in this season of the ministry for the next 20 years or so. Uh, and, and then we'll see after that if we want to keep it or, or move to a different area and do something similar. But in any case, uh, pray for us for that. Uh, we welcome your prayer support in that regard. All right. I'm going to go ahead now and switch us over and we'll enter into our lesson. So those are all just updates, announcements, things like that. And uh, what we want to do is transition now. I'm working my buttons here for those who happen to watch and see stuff here. And we're going to go ahead and dive into this... Um, this lesson that I put together for us today. All right, let's see if this comes up on the screen. Overlooked essentials of preaching well done. Overlooked essentials of preaching well done. If you know anything about missions uh, and biblical missions, preaching is actually kind of at the heart of all missions work. Uh, it's something that never ceases in, in the work of biblical missions. You Preaching is central, just like we see in Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we see the apostles going out with a message, proclaiming it, heralding a message, uh, leading people to Christ, preaching to crowds of one, two, five, ten, a hundred thousands, uh, 
Preaching is always happening. And then there's Sunday worship. There's the preaching that's happening there, the, the building up of the body of Christ, the encouraging the saints, equipping of the saints, the teaching from house to house. There was a time when Sunday evening, I believe it was, when Paul the Apostle was with a group of believers. He had Potentially, this was the last time he was going to see them. He uh, went into a long discourse, and someone fell out of the window, and he brought him up, and he just kept on going, preaching and preaching, passing on the Word of God, instructing others in how to live, and so on. It's an essential thing of Christian life, the preaching of the Word of God, the listening to the right, uh, preaching of the Word of God, rightly receiving the Word of God, and it's a central thing as well, we could say, to missions work also. Now, interestingly, uh, there's a lot of missions work that goes on where preaching is totally forgotten about. Preaching doesn't actually happen. Evangelism doesn't happen. It's just going and digging wells or building buildings or bringing gifts or bringing medicine and uh, not bad in themselves, those things. But if the preaching gets forgotten about, I would say something is missing there. Something is, has gone astray in those types of uh, scenarios, right? So we're going to get into this a little bit today, uh, but ultimately uh, I would say this to start us off. Few things are worse than bad preaching, right? So these overlooked essentials of preaching well done, we're reminded here that really We've all sat through some bad preaching. We've all heard some bad preaching. Maybe some of us are hearing bad preaching today, and we don't even know it's bad preaching, right? That, that's possible as well. Uh, but few things are worse uh, than bad preaching. It's, it puts people to sleep. It can lead people astray. Uh, it can be just painful and hard to listen to. All kinds of things can be a result of, of bad preaching. It's something that we want to avoid if we can. And uh, not everybody is called to be preaching behind the pulpit. That Few are the men that are called to actually that task of preaching and teaching and equipping the body of Christ. Uh, but all of us have some kind of role in preaching. So this is helpful, I believe, for all of us, not just for the missionary, not just for the aspiring missionary uh, or, or, or the, the, the gospel laborer, but uh, for everyday Christians as well, because we should be preaching in some degree as we're discipling others or as we're evangelizing lost. That's something that all of us are called to do, to be involved in evangelizing the lost, uh, preaching, and, uh, and, and and discipling. And so, on. so it has that place in the everyday Christian life. Uh, but at best, uh, bad preaching, at best it puts people to sleep and they are left no better off after the encounter of listening to preaching. So bad preaching at best, it puts people to sleep and they're just not, they're not gaining anything from the whole experience. At worst, bad preaching leads people astray. False doctrine, bad applications, erroneous views of God, etc. All that kind of stuff can come about as a result of bad uh, preaching. So uh, as we dive into this here, uh, to, to kick it off, uh, there's two main ditches really that I think uh, we can fall into. Two main ditches. And uh, when it comes to preaching, you can fall either to the left or you can fall uh, to the right. Both of these are ditches that we uh, want to avoid as Christians. And if we're involved in ministry as preachers, uh, to avoid as well. We don't want to fall off to the right, and we don't want to fall off to the left. To the left, I guess we could say here, what we have is uh, Mr. Stone Cold. All right, so we can take a look here at Mr. Stone Cold. Uh, we don't want to fall into this trap of being stone cold. Uh, this is typically, uh, you can understand that the sto Mr. Stone Cold would be dry. He would be boring. Uh, his, his preaching would be more like a lecture. Uh, it would be disengaged and potentially simply just reading a presentation of some sort. Uh, looking down, reading... Uh, passing on information, very, very dry and boring. More likely, though, uh, this person would be theologically sound, Mr. Stone Cold. He wouldn't be making that error. You know, on the, So if he's falling to the left and he's Mr. Stone Cold, his error would be he's, he's dry, he's boring, he's lecture-like, it's disengaging, uh, he, or he's not engaging the people, that kind of thing. Uh, but he's more likely to actually be sound, though. Uh, and the problem here with Mr. Stone Cold is he's just hard to listen to. It, it's hard, even if you have good intentions, to receive what God would have you, even if the information is correct, even if it's good and it's solid and it's sound, to receive it is hard because you, you lost appetite. You're no longer hungry. It's perhaps like uh, you want to have a meal, but there's smoke in the air and you can't quite breathe well to really taste and enjoy the food you're trying to enjoy. Something to that effect. Uh, so it can be hard to listen to and hard to digest, even if it's good. Uh, typically, this person would have good doctrine, uh, but he just struggles to exhort and to properly preach, right? So, so that's one ditch, Mr. Mr. Stone Cold, we could say. Another ditch would be Mr. Motivation. What is Mr. Motivation? Mr. Motivation would likely be the guy, instead of preaching, he's doing a TED Talk or he's doing a motivational speech uh, of some sorts. He probably has everything all memorized. He doesn't have to look at his Bible. He's just walking around on the stage. He's looking really hip and cool. Perhaps there's flashing lights. Perhaps there's smoke, whatever it might be, or music playing in the background. Mr. Motivational Speaker. Uh, we could liken this person to uh, the man with uh, zeal that has no knowledge. Uh, typically, we could, we could see that. But uh, on the positive side, this person would be more uh, than, instead of Mr. Stone Cold, this person might be more likely to be, uh, to, to, um, to be exciting or to be captivating, like he gets your attention, right? Uh, but often at the cost of being 
being superficial or even erroneous. So Mr. Motivation has that tendency to typically go uh, to make error, theologically speaking, and lead people astray in that regard, or to just be superficial, same stuff over and over, no real depth to it. Uh, he's easy to listen to, uh, typically, uh, but he's not always, usually, he's not good for your soul, actually. He's just uh, uh, whetting your appetite, but never really giving you any substance. Uh, typically, this person would be a better communicator, but lacks sound doctrine. All right. So that's the idea there with uh, with our two errors, our two main ditches. We would have Mr. Stone Cold, perhaps on the left and Mr. Motivational Speaker on the right. Both have gone astray and they're not fruitful, uh, helpful preachers in the kingdom. Right. So we, we, we would argue that now. Uh, let me see if I can uh, move to the next slide here. OK, uh, this is helpful for us as we as we dive into this. Proverbs uh, chapter 19, verse 2, we read this. Proverbs 19, verse 2. Zeal without knowledge is not good, or to act hastily and miss the way. Zeal without knowledge is not good. Zeal without knowledge is not good. And to follow up with this, we have a quote here from Brother John Calvin from many years ago, which is just a wonderful one. I heard this a long time ago and always remained. It's important. He said this, zeal without doctrine or right teaching, zeal without good teaching, zeal without doctrine, is like a sword in the hand of a lunatic. It's like a sword in the hand of a lunatic. Uh, other times, perhaps, we've heard the same concept. Uh, the idea would be, it's like a sword in the hand of a drunk man, uh, right? Or someone who's just out of his mind. A sword in his hand, he's just dangerous wherever he goes. He's he's putting people in danger all the time. He's he's exciting and he's zealous. He's, oh, okay, yeah. But without sound doctrine, without something to hold him grounded and keep him rooted... He's like the sword in the hand of a lunatic. Anybody could get hurt. Kids could get stabbed. Pregnant people could get hurt. Uh, moms, dads, uh, you know, anything could happen. Uh, the wrong guy could get, instead of the bad guy getting stabbed, the, the, your, your uh, companion in the trenches fighting the good fight could get stabbed instead. Uh, zeal without not, doctrine is like a sword in the hand of a lunatic. Very good quote, actually. Uh, there's a lot that can be said uh, about that, and it's, it's applicable to this discourse today. All right, our first point now, though, to dive into this lesson, uh, abide daily in the Word. So if you want to be, uh, yeah, when it comes to, if you want to be a, a preacher who hears from the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, the first, uh, first thing we would mention today is make sure you are abiding daily in the Word. Back to our idea here of overlooked essentials of preaching well done. Number one, the thing you need to do is make sure you're abiding daily in the Word. You must be self-fed through regular meeting with the Lord in the living Word of God. You have to be self-fed. If you're not fed well yourself, it's very unlikely that you'll, for a consistent, significant period of time, be able to feed others if you're not first well fed same old discourse like uh, when you're on the airplane and the airplane's going down or about to crash whatever it is they tell you make sure that you first take the oxygen mask before you go to help others if you try to help others before you put on your own oxygen mask next thing you know you're running out of breath you might get the other person hooked up but then you're scrambling and you're not thinking clearly to get your own mask and you end up dying and perishing in a similar way when it comes to preaching and being a, a faithful preacher of the word of god you need to make sure that you are first and foremost before you go speaking to other people preaching to them make sure that you're fed make sure that you're well nourished first you should be reading the word of god abiding in the word of god being well nourished and the overflow of all that you're receiving as you're in the living word of god the overflow then you pass on to others that's that's kind of the idea here behind what we're saying with this particular point of application uh, so uh, a tip here that I would give uh, and uh, is, is something that was given to me years ago. I was counseled to this, and it's one of the things that absolutely transformed my life and also my preaching and teaching ministry. Simply dedicate yourself, whether you feel like it or not, make it a discipline to read one hour every morning of the Word of God. So the, you might have uh, prayer time, which is we, we could... They kind of overlap sometimes, uh, but you, you also have study time in the Word of God, but simply reading... If anything, you just take down a couple notes as you're reading it or highlight a couple things, uh, but reading the Word of God, just letting it go in, letting it saturate you, letting it fill you, letting it transform you, let it shape you, that kind of idea is what we're getting at here. So this would be a tip to abide daily in the Word f towards that task of being a, a preacher who hears, well done, good and faithful servant. Number one, abide daily, but dedicate time to that. And it's astonishing, actually, how much then the Holy Spirit brings Scripture to mind even as you're preaching or, or you're teaching, when you're saturated, when you're full all the time, stuff just comes to mind. And when you're evangelizing and when you're discipling, it's there, it's on your mind, it's in your heart, and it comes out. And it's just the most beautiful thing to see how God the Holy Spirit is working because you have committed yourself to abiding 
in the Word of God. It's astonishing how it transforms uh, both your preparing and your actually uh, your delivering uh, of the Word of God as well. All right, so those are some points there that we mentioned regarding this first application here uh, towards the path of being a, a preacher who hears, well done, good and faithful servant. Abide daily in the Word. Second point of application that we can look at today would be speak to the people. Seems kind of obvious. Seems, of course, uh, who else would you speak to? You're not going to speak to the animals. You're not going to speak to the trees, right? You got to speak to the people. But uh, in recent months, I've looked around and I've seen different preaching on different Sundays. And a consistent thing I see over and over is when it comes time for, to hear the word of God, I see the pulpit, I see the preacher, I see the Bible, and I see often a man looking down and reading notes reading a discourse that he's written down, hopefully it was him that wrote it down, and not looking up at the people except for on rare occasions. Totally disengaged. Uh, I do think it's, it's, it's simple and it's important. You have to be looking at the people. These are God's people. You're there to shepherd them, to feed them, to nourish them. Looking at them shows that you care, that you're involved. Uh, it, it's something that can't be uh, overlooked. Uh, mere rhetoric, I would argue, or reading is not the same as preaching. Now, I have friends who who bring uh, a manuscript into the pulpit, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly good. They they err on the side of not wanting to say things that don't make sense or aren't theologically accurate, so they make sure it's written down, and then they... But, uh, but I have friends who do that that are gifted and able to have it there but not be looking down, uh, uh, to stay engaged with the people. So you can do that. You can have it written down if you want. That's good. It's not a bad thing at all. You just have to make sure that you're engaging with the people and looking at them. Not everybody does that. It's something you have to actually do, though. Uh, so a, a couple side points here that I would mention, uh, some other things that related to this simply uh, speaking to the people. Uh, so, okay, so I mentioned look at them. It's important just to be making eye contact, right? Uh, you're speaking to them on behalf of God. You can't forget that. It's important. You not you got to actually be looking at the people. God is having you uh, feed the Word of God, okay? Okay. Um, People can read your thoughts elsewhere if they want. So if you're just simply looking down and reading, you might as you could basically just take that document and hand it to them on a piece of paper, and they could read your thoughts that way. Preaching is different in the fact that it's it's spontaneous, it's live. There's something going on. It's a special moment in the gathering of the saints where they're hearing from God through the Word of God, but also through you delivering it to them. Having spent time in the Word, having spent time in study, having spent time in prayer, having spent time with the Lord, now you're delivering a message personally as well. So speaking to the people has to do with, with that as well. Uh, people need to hear from God through you. That's what we're getting at here. All right, our, our next application point. So number one, abide daily in the Word. If you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, as a preacher and teacher of the Word of God, speak to the people. Number three, involve the people for maximum retention. This is a point that we wanted to share. Involve the people for maximum retention. And the point being here, it's simply uh, simply hearing is not actually enough. I think it's been said that uh, when we hear something, we remember something like 10 or 15 percent of what we heard. If we hear and see something or are engaged, more of our faculties are engaged, we can understand or remember, retain something like 40 to 70 percent of what we hear. There's more likely that we'll uh, retain what we hear when there's multiple ways of our faculties being engaged. Uh, so involving the people has that idea of simply hearing is not actually enough. We need more than simply hearing. That's what we're arguing here. Uh, so it's 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 not enough simply to read, I, I would argue. You have to somehow be engaging the crowd and, and, and bringing that to them. But practically speaking, what we're talking about here is uh, you have to have some form of what I call a, a buy-in. Uh, you have to demonstrate to the people why they should listen to you. Why should they listen? Why should they care about what you have to say? You have to Help them understand why this is it's not just, I mean, it, they should want to hear, naturally. If they're a Christian and they're in church and they're, they're coming to hear, they should want to hear. But it's good to show them why what you're saying, how it relates to their everyday life and how they need to hear it and something God will give them through it to help them live more faithfully to the Lord. Uh, you want to let people know, I think it's, it's good practice to let people know where you are leading them and then bring them with you. You can map out a little bit. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to look at. And here's where we're going to arrive. These are the things we're going to cover. You kind of get people a roadmap of sorts. So, they, okay, I have a, I know where we're at now. I know where we're heading. There's a destination. Let's see if I can track and get where I'm supposed to go with the help of the preacher today. So these are the things that we have in mind with involving the people for maximum retention. Uh, not just speaking dry words to them and hoping they'll stick around, but getting their faculties involved, right? That's the idea. There should be a, some sort of an introduction, some sort of a closure, uh, a, 
a body, in, as I call it, in the middle, so an introduction, and then getting into the heat or, or the, the heart of the text. I call it the heart of the text. And then a closure, somehow wrapping it all together, tying all things together in some fashion, challenging, exhorting, these kinds of things. Uh, but throughout, we should be engaging, by God's grace, people's faculties, their sight, their taste, their smell, their vision, their hearts, their intellects, their desires. you got to find ways, by God's grace, to somehow uh, involve people's faculties. And then lastly, we'll say this. Good illustrations. I remember my, my mentor, still today, he's one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard in my life and likely ever will. Something very uh, unique about the man and very special, but he was jam-packed with good illustrations. They just poured out of him all the time. For me, analogies come to mind, different things. You know, God has given me that ability. Stories, not so much, but this guy was a, was a storyteller, had a really gifted storyteller, and uh, probably was inspired by Jesus Christ, who also told stories, told parables. He understood there's something about that that is a way of communicating to the hearts. Uh, so good illustrations are really helpful as well. Uh, you don't want to have too many illustrations, but you do need a couple here and there, and they really do help drive home a point. Uh, so uh, to that point, let's look at uh, Charles Spurgeon here. A couple wonderful quotes. The greatest preacher of all time, potentially. Uh, the prince of preachers, as they call him. At one time, he said this, if we are faithful to the spirit of the gospel, we labor to make things plain. It is our study to be simple and to be understood by the most illiterate of our hearers. Let us then set forth many a metaphor and parable before the people. There's trends today where we try to be either sophisticated or like the TED Talk guy, whatever it is. Uh, all of it, you know, is, is not necessary. A good preacher actually strives to be simple. I love this about Charles Spurgeon. It was probably why he was so loved. And also my mentor specifically was known to be very simple as well in language that everyday people could understand and connect with. Uh, there's something important about that. If we're going to be faithful to the spirit of the gospel, he says, let us labor to make things plain. Beautiful, beautiful idea. Another one then from Charles Spurgeon, another really helpful one on this regard. This has to do with the idea of windows. So if you look at our picture here in this particular slide, we have typical Italian windows. This is how buildings look here, how windows look, often lots of colors, always shutters that actually work. But the window illustration, uh, Charles Spurgeon gave uh, had a good view of how that should work, what that is like in regards to preaching. Windows, he says, greatly add to the pleasure and agreeableness of a habitation. And so do illustrations make a sermon pleasurable and interesting. A building without windows would be a prison rather than a house, for it would be quite dark, and no one would care to take it upon lease. And in the same way, a discourse without a parable is prosy and dull and involves a grievous weariness of the flesh." Imagine that. That's what you don't want to be. If you want to, if you want to be a, a preacher who hears from the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, you don't want to hear words like your preaching was prosy and dull and involves a grievous weariness of the flesh. You don't want to be the one known to put people to sleep or just make them bored out of their minds when you're preaching. You need to be somewhat lively. Now, even if you don't have a lot of personality, you need to at least use illustrations that can open the window and help people to see brighter and better what it is the Lord would have them hear and understand through the preaching of the Word. Our next point is uh, this one here. Let God's work speak primarily. Let God's Word speak primarily. And what we're getting at here is this idea of trust the living word, and the good Lord more than you trust yourself. What can happen to the average preacher, typically speaking, is it's, it's, it's a nerve-wracking kind of thing. It can be terrifying. Already people are scared to death to speak in front of other people. That's typical. I understood that very well. I never wanted to speak in front of people. I was the last thing I would ever do. I always avoided it all my life. And then I got saved and was understood the privilege that I have to be able to pass on the Word of God and God and the Holy Spirit enables me to speak and to teach these kinds of things. And now I see it in a totally different light and I actually can find joy in preaching and teaching and, and speaking in front of other people. The average person doesn't want to do it though, uh, but when they do start doing it, they get nervous is what I'm getting at. So a so person can, can get very nervous when it comes to preaching because now it's a heavy matter. It's not just any old discourse that you're doing, but you're speaking about the things of God. You're speaking things that could literally alter somebody's life for good or for bad if you're erroneous. So there's a heavy weight when it comes to preaching, actually. Uh, but what can often happen is someone gets excited because they think too much about themselves. They think uh, they're more than they actually are. You need to remember you're just a mouthpiece, actually. You, God can strike a straight blow even with a crooked stick. 
right? He can, he can make something that you say that's erroneous be life transformational in the right way for somebody else. It really is all his work. And it's God, the Holy Spirit, whose word, he, uh, God, the Holy Spirit inspired the word of God. It's God breathed the word of God. It's alive. It's living. But also it's accompanied by God, the Holy Spirit. Trust in the living word more than you trust in yourself. And trust that the good Lord, he's with you as you're faithfully seeking to preach and to teach God's word. Such relief that is already, if you understand rightly the power of the word of God itself, simply reading it, as it is, is transformational to lives and hearts and families and so on. Just let them hear it. And our point being uh, here, as we share this idea, is ultimately that you don't need theatrics. Uh, what happens with uh, Mr. Uh, motivational is he depends more, actually, I believe, on theatrics. He dis he depends on the timing of his discourse, on the way he struts about and presents himself, his elegance, his ability to communicate and to look sophisticated. He depends on his TED Talk type message more than he depends on the living Word of God. And that can often happen where uh, that's why the, the Word of God is no longer uh, sufficient for these folks, but they have to actually spice things up radical with wild, crazy illustrations, people flying in on cables or whatever, all kinds of things, or crazy, wild slideshow presentations, uh, videos, and all the rest. The Word of God is, is a marvelous thing. Depend on it and trust on it is what we're saying with this point of application. Let the Word of God speak primarily. You don't need theatrics. Get it out of your mind. You don't need it. When you're rightly preaching the Word of God, it's transforming lives. God, the Holy Spirit, is active as you're faithfully presenting the message. Fifth point, as we continue on in this lesson towards uh, faithful preaching, preaching that uh, the essentials of faithful preaching that lead to the servant of God hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, feed them one main point. Point number five here, feed them one main point. When you're preaching the Word of God, there's tons of applications, tons of different points, usually within a passage. But you have to back up, capture the context, and we'll get into that more in our preaching course at the Missions Academia, the PMC Missions Academia, where we'll get into the, the how-to of preaching and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there, there, there usually is one main point within the text. You have to back out. You have to understand the context. Who was writing it? Why were they writing it? What was going on? Why was this necessary? How does it connect to the redemptive story of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And what does it mean for us living in light of that, that the kingdom has come, that Jesus is reigning and ruling, and we're called to bear fruit and be salt and be light, etc., and be uh, the body of Christ, and you drive home that main point, all right? Uh, so you need to know that main point, and you need to have a main point with your message. You're not simply uh, reciting something or reading something, and that's it, but there is a message God would have these people receive, uh, and, and you're, you're driving that point home, and there's a variety of ways to do that. We'll talk briefly about it now, and that'll be for another time, perhaps, but uh, never let them go malnourished is the main point we wanted to see here. Uh, so you have to have one main point, and you can't let them go malnourished. I've sat under some preaching of recent where uh, there's just lots and lots of talking, all kinds of things being said, and you have no idea what was the actual main point. What am I supposed to take from this? Really hard to listen to, really hard to understand, and you don't know what was he actually trying to say. And ultimately, I don't think he knew what he was actually trying to say. It is a thing. It can happen. We don't want to be that guy. We don't want that to happen. Uh, we want to know the main point, and we want to drive it home. And I share in this picture here of our illustration for those who watch the podcast episode, or not just listen, but watch. There's a picture here of a beautiful plate of Italian pasta. There's like a million different ways to make Italian pasta, so many different types of noodles, so many different ways to, to, to make it. It's really astonishing. You can, you can live in Italy for like an entire year and not have the same kind of pasta twice. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's really crazy. Uh, but in any case, uh, my mentor back in the day, he was a really good cook, actually, which was an astonishing thing. And uh, I caught on to this idea that I think he believed, and with all his heart, uh, f preaching is kind of like feeding. You're feeding souls. Feed my sheep. Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. And uh, my mentor was a great cook, very good cook. He could invent his own types of meals and use what he has. And he made everything very flavorful. He understood something. But the average Italian cook, the average Italian person, understanding uh, Italian cuisine and all the rest, understands this as well, that uh, they don't want too many flavors in their mouth at one time. That's why they have, uh, they have an antipasto, just to whet the appetite, you know, help you to calm down, a little bit of wine, an antipasto, an appetizer. And uh, then when your plate arrives, you don't just devour it because you're starving. You have already wet your appetite, and now you're able to appreciate the main course or the, the first plate. The first plate comes around. It's not too abundant. It's just the right amount, uh, right? And there's not too many flavors. Uh, that's a key to, I think, the Italian cuisine. Uh, so they have enough uh, flavors that it captivates you, and it's good, and it leaves a good taste in your mouth. Then will come the secondo piatto, the second plate. Again, not too many flavors all at once, but they're separated. So now you have a meat and typically a vegetable, something like this, and, and you have that. And then, uh, and then 
Then you'll move on to perhaps uh, a salad then to, to help you digest and to bring it all down, right? And, uh, and, and that's a different experience as well. And then you'll move on to uh, like a dessert with a, with a little coffee, a little espresso. The, the espresso is typically the last thing you'll have unless you go and do a, a digestive, a digestivo as they call it here, which is a whole other thing. But typically you would end with a, with a little espresso. Why the little espresso? Well, it's not going to give you a ton of caffeine. It's not going to like wake you up and drive you crazy for the rest of the day. Uh, there's a little bit of caffeine actually in an espresso. Uh, but what it does do really well, the espresso, is it leaves you a really wonderful flavor in your mouth. That's the beauty of espresso. It's rich, it's creamy, it's delightful to the palate, and it's a great way to close a meal. The, the Italian understands that. He'll close the meal with a nice espresso just to finish things off, leave a real good flavor in your mouth, and then you can go about whatever you have to do next. So the Italian person, when it comes to, I, I think even my mentor here, when it came to preaching, he understood all these things. And I remember at a time when I had to be lovingly uh, challenged or corrected, too much good in your sermon, Jesse. Too much there. It was just too much. Too many things on the plate. It's like a Thanksgiving dinner with everything mixed together. Forget that. Uh, not bad. It's all good stuff that you said, but try to remember there's one main point that you got to drive home. This was counseled to me and I hung on to that. I remembered that. And it's not something I'm an expert at today, but it is something I try to apply and I would encourage others to try to do the same as well. Uh, you don't want too many flavors in the mouth. You can't have too much on there. You got to understand uh, you want to leave a good flavor in the mouth as, as you're delivering the word of God. Now, the word of God is rich and it's abundant. And there's all kinds of flavors and spice there. There's all kinds of things that add to our life. But again, getting back to that idea of a one main point you want to drive home, there can be other points. There should be other points, some sub points and different things that tie into everyday Christian living, but there should be always one main point that you want to drive home. Don't overload uh, the plate, I guess is what we could say uh, in another way, right? So find a way to make it clear. It could be through repetition. It could be through uh, restated uh, the point in various ways. It could be through a parable or a story, these kinds of things. Uh, but you have to have a point to deliver. And uh, if, if you don't have one main point to deliver, we could argue perhaps you're not ready yet to be in the pulpit. And perhaps when you don't have a main point to deliver, that's why also sermons tend to go longer. Uh, the less prepared you are, the less work you've done in the forefront or to understand that main idea and to decide by God's grace how you're going to deliver that. Usually when you do less preparation, you usually end up preaching longer. And, uh, and then it just goes too much. My mentor was also good. Again, one of the best preachers I've ever heard and ever will probably. Uh, he was good. He was known for saying, uh, if you can't say it in 35 minutes, you ain't going to say it in an hour either. So just get that in your mind. And uh, that stuck with me as well. And that's really good. So I try to keep a, a sermon between 35 and 45 minutes, no more than 45. If I'm at 45, I need to end because clearly I'm not able to drive home the main point. But you got to have that main point and you got to think about how to actually uh, deliver that. So too often uh, what happens here when it comes to feeding with a main point, too often there is no main point for the preacher or there's hundreds or just tons of secondary, less important points. All kinds of stuff is just information overload, right? Not necessary for Sunday preaching. Sunday is not where you're doing your Bible study. It's not where you're going in-depth in theology and all the rest. It's where you're being nourished, revived, saturated again. You're going to the delectable mountains. You're seeing where you're headed. You're reminded of who you are, who Christ is, that he reigns, that he rules. And you're, you're not motivated, but you are. You're motivated in a godly way to continue pursuing the Lord day after day, worshiping, worshiping the Lord day after day, and together with your own family, growing in grace, growing in study throughout the rest of the week, and so on. Uh, that's kind of how it all uh, should fit together. Um, yeah, but again, lastly, we would just argue here, feed them on my point, but whatever you do, don't let them go away malnourished. Make sure they're being fed. Give them something. Uh, you have to keep that stuff in mind. Next point. Uh, just three more here, and we close out this lesson. Put them not to sleep. That one should be obvious. I have to struggle with this uh, because I'm just so low-key. I'm so easygoing. I have a, what they call a radio voice. I can put people to sleep easily. My wife knows it. When I, if I want to see my wife get tired and fall asleep, I just open a book and I start reading to her and she'll be half knocked out within like five minutes. My voice just does that, has that effect of knocking people out, putting them to sleep. But clearly the preacher has to resist. You do not want to put people to sleep. Nobody eats well when they're sleeping. Nobody eats well when they're sleeping. I have no sub points for this one. Just simply needs to be stated. Uh, whatever you have to do, just make sure you're awake. Make sure you're energized. Make sure you're lively. Paul the Apostle will get his strength, the energy. He, he, he did what he was called to do with the strength that came from God himself. The energy, energized by the gospel. When you're feeling weary, when you're feeling down, and often ministry can feel like that. As I read this morning from uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 13, I believe it was, with my family. Um, remember, recall the Lord Jesus Christ, who endured so much affliction 
from those who put him uh, on the cross and so on. He endured that for you. Let that motivate you. Let that energize you. It's an important matter, the preaching of God's word. Be motivated. Be excited. Don't take them to the, the green pastures on when it's time to preach. Let the Lord take them to green pastures every morning, every night. You need to get them riled up a little bit. You need to uh, find some energy. Take an extra coffee if you need to, uh, But because nobody eats well when they're sleeping. You don't want to bore them to death and put them to sleep. And unfortunately, as we all know, too often, uh, preaching has been understood to be something totally boring, totally irrelevant, and that's not good. It ought not be that way. We want to avoid that. If you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, avoid putting people to sleep. Second last point, be yourself, not someone else. Be yourself, not someone else. Here we have a, a picture of uh, a bunch of stones stacked on a pile, and it reminds me of uh, what, what Peter says, how we're living stones, and the Lord is edifying His church each of us is alive. We're living stones put together. Each of us is different. We have different shapes, different sizes, different purposes, different places on the wall, and so to speak. We all have a different role to play, and each of us is important in the same kind of way. Every part of the wall is important. Every part of the building of the body of Christ is important, actually. So don't try too hard to be something you're not. Know who God, God made you the way you are for a reason, and you won't be the same 10 years from now. You'll be different because God will continue to be transforming us day after day more into the image of Christ. But who you are today is who God wants you to be today, and you need to uh, be yourself, actually. He fashioned you the way you are uh, for good reason, right? Uh, but uh, others, we need to remind us, uh, this, we're reminded of this, though, because others do help shape us uh, and that's normal. That's good. We become like those who have discipled us. We become more like our master, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's normal. That's part of life. I remember there's there's the famous uh, R.C. Sproul, and he was uh, mentored and discipled by Gershner, John Gershner, I believe his name is. And if you if you didn't notice, these are two different people. Their voice and the way they talk, the way they communicate, their little growl in their voice, they sound like almost the same person. It's really mind-blowing. Go check it out for yourself. John Gerstner and R.C. Sproul, listen to their voices. They sound almost identical. The way in which they communicate and teach and preach, it's almost the same. It's, it's identical. It's really astonishing. Uh, but clearly, two different paths God put them on, two different purposes. But God had a purpose as well for bringing them together uh, and for John Gerstner to influence R.C. Sproul the way he did so he could become the person God had him to be, it's okay that you're a little bit like your mentor or the one who God used to, to train you. It's normal. But at the same time, develop your own voice. Know that you're unique. You know that you're different. And, and you have your purpose to fulfill in the way God has made you. And, and that's okay. So uh, I would add to this as well, this idea of, of be yourself, not someone else. Uh, we can't forget, though, at the same time, deny yourself is part of the call to follow Christ. You have to deny yourself as well. And that relates to preaching and well done. Forget yourself. It's not about you. Don't let yourself, don't, you can't get in the way, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. And that can happen when, when we think too much about ourselves, when we think that we're actually having an influence that only God, the Holy Spirit can actually have an influence for the positive, for the good of his people and so on through our preaching. That's all the work of God. It's all God's grace. Don't fall into that trap of thinking you're actually doing something, really. You are, and it's very important work. You have to take it very seriously. That's why we're having this talk today, this lesson. At the same time, though, it's not about you at all. Uh, so it's helpful to keep that in mind. Be yourself, not someone else. Uh, God fashioned you the way you are for a reason. Others shape us, but you have to develop your own voice. Be the person God made you to be, and so on. And and, and But continue. You're growing in grace, becoming more like Christ. And you're always going to be denying yourself as well. you got to forget yourself. It's not about you. Get out of the way. Don't get in the way. Let the God's Word arrive to the people. Don't, don't be too good or too bad that you distract them. Just get it done, and then get out of the way and let people grow in grace and let God the, and His Word do His thing. All right? Lastly here, we'll close out with this one. Let your motivation uh, be love for God. For a number of years, at the top of uh, every outline that I create, uh, that I, I, when I go into the pulpit, I typically take uh, an outline, one page outline, maybe some cross references so I don't have to flip through the Bible on another page. And then maybe as well, uh, just the, the text, the main text that I'm preaching from with all my little notes all over it, right? And that's all I'll have. Uh, but at the top of my outline, I always simply write, why? Why am I doing this? And number one reason, I love God. That's my motivation. If I didn't love God, I wouldn't want to do this. I wouldn't care and I wouldn't take it seriously. But let that be your motivation. This is my encouragement for you. If you're in, involved in the preaching of God's word and you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, seal this unto your heart and you won't miss the mark. There's all kinds of other motivations that are good. There's some that are bad. But one that is always good and right and, and helpful is to remember why you're doing it in the first place. It ought to be 
because you love God. What is the greatest commandment the Lord said? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Secondly, then, to love your neighbor as yourself. These are important things. So let love for God be your primary motivation. Seal it into your heart and you won't miss the mark. All right, so just to recap today, uh, as we close out this lesson, I hope that was edifying for you. Uh, we want, we heard about this discourse of, um, what was it, of uh, o- overlooked essentials of preaching well done, right? So essential things here that can't be overlooked if you want to hear well done in regarding your proclaiming of the Word of God, whatever that looks like for you. But as we close out, uh, the points were this, abide daily in the Word, speak to the people Involve the people for maximum retention. That's what we desire. We want people to retain what they hear and be transformed. Uh, Let God's word speak. Have a main point and feed them that main point in a variety of ways, but get them a main point to take home with them, something to hang on to. Put them not to sleep. Be yourself and let your motivation remain love for God. These are our exhortations uh, for today. That was episode number 312. May God bless you as you consider those things. And we'll we'll be back next week with another episode, Lord willing, uh, on Missions Incorporated, the podcast of Practical Missions Cohort. Thanks for being with us, and God bless you.